We'll start with uh, this. I'll give you a little bit of an overview. I One of the last courses I took in graduate school was on um, item response theory and measurement. And uh, this, this is one aspect of it. There are other ways of measuring data or measuring humans, wild humans in the wild, as they say. And, uh, but this is one that's sort of easy to understand and to get us into more complicated things later. Uh, I have to compliment the physical therapy profession because they've been, they've been working on this in terms of diagnosis and, and uh, which, diagno which orthopedic neurological test is most informative. So let's get started. Let's see how this works. First of all, I know this looks like a non sequitur, but uh, I want to take the journey to Mars. Um, what, in an earlier presentation, I had a red cow jumping over Mars, and Dr. Bay corrected me that it's a cow jumped over the moon, so, so I'm, I'm still on Mars. <clears throat> we spend a lot of money getting to Mars and, and orbiting Mars and landing on Mars, the curiosity and all that. And uh, if, if you look at the, the amount of money that we've spent and the kinds of things we've spent there, we're looking for something, right? Probably looking for life. That would be the, the, the real kicker, is if we could find out that there has been or there is life on Mars, and how would that life be similar to ours or different from ours? So if we send all these things up there and we don't have something that would, uh, say, look for carbon-based life forms, we, we won't see it. So if there's some other kind of life form out there, silicon-based or uranium-based or something, plutonium-based, we're not going to see it probably. So the point being, and you can put on your 3D glasses if you like, because Mars is actually in 3D here, um, even though it's covered a bit. If we look on Mars, there's a curiosity. It's drilling holes in the rocks. It's, it's going to put them into a little thing and with acid or, or flame or something to see what the rock's made of. We do, by the way, find a lot of meteors from Mars, a fair amount, especially in Antarctica. And here's another 3D picture. Uh, this is a scan of the landscape of Mars. What does this have to do with Roche analysis? We'll get to that. Can you see it? I can't, Kurt and I couldn't get this thing to, to, to work out unless we crossed our eyes and that wasn't too helpful. But the back of it looked pretty good. So just, this is a panorama of the Martian landscape. Next thing to being there. All right, so if we're going to measure humans, humans behavior, uh, perception, health, wellness, disease, disability, we'll have a series of items that we need to, to use to address these things. The Roche tradition comes out of psychophysics in the 19th century, where we noticed when people just had a just notable, noticeable difference of pain, or they could see light, or this, they felt like the sound had increased. So getting past the, uh, our self-conceptions here, what if we look at inside their heads and we find more Martian rocks? And uh, this one has a laser drilled into it, and the other one doesn't. Probably cost us a lot of money to do that experiment. But, and these aren't, uh, these aren't 3D. Yeah, thanks. So here's what Kurt does. All this garbage over here, and here's what I do. See how simple and elegant what I do is compared to what Kurt does? Anyway, um, we have a lot of tools, uh, Kurt and I and other stat statistical types, and we, we can work with a lot of data, but some of it isn't good. You know, some data is garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. So we're for analyzing garbagey data. Uh, then all of this won't help very much. Um, so 
here's a kind of a word salad of some statistical terms that we often use. We've got, I got heavy chains going down there. They're holding them up and all this. Null hypothesis significance testing, which I often criticize. But here's measurement. How do we measure humans? What do we measure and why do we measure it? So in the case of physical therapy or physical medicine, we might want to know if somebody's disabled or we might want to know if they have some kind of a um, prognosis based on their current symptoms. So what I've done down here, I just show that they're reliable and valid measures. We can, we can survey our patients. We can ask them a series of questions. Some surveys, some physical tests, orthopedic tests will be both reliable and valid. And we could talk about those distinctions another time, but we want to see if we're gaining information that would lead to their better treatment and management. So in psychology, we have a long tradition of designing instruments, which is another way of filling out a paper and pencil kind of test to see if you have, uh, to see what your IQ is, what your ability is. When I was in high school, um, we had the army or military tests that were handed out to discern if we had mechanical ability or good memory or spatial abilities. So when we got drafted, they could put us in the right slot. So what are we looking for then? We give a test on IQ, we're looking for intelligence. There are uh, personality tests or ability tests. For the most part, we're looking for an ability. And we want all our questions to kind of tell us something about an ability. This ability is also called latent trait, um, latent construct, or theta. Psychologists refer to it as theta. Those are all synonyms for the same, same thing. And what we're gonna do here is look at how these items collectively tell us something about this, this uh, construct that they all have in common. As teachers, uh, you all have to design tests to make sure your students accomplish the learning that you want them to learn. In the case of all of you, there are not just cognition learning, but there's also physical learning. So, so this, this is 3D. Um, I'm getting a big kick out of this. So. And it's quite, it's quite impressive. I, I hope it's still impressive with you. I bring up a peacock. I wanted a turkey, but I couldn't find a 3D picture of a turkey. But what I wanted to say was there's a turkey, we're, and it's Thanksgiving, and we're putting it in the oven. How do we know it's done? We have thermometers in it. Probably one, but let's say we had 20. Really get an accurate, reliable, valid measurement of whether the turkey's done or not but we don't, we don't have pictures of turkeys in 3D. <laughs> anyway, there's two grand traditions of measurement. One is test scores, which is called classical test theory, and this scaling, which I'm introducing today. We're all kind of uh, familiar with the test score approach, and we'll get more into that now. This Test score tradition, also called classical test theory, uh, works with item total correlations. In other words, each item contributes some information about the total score, and we think the total score has something to do with the thing we're measuring. So it's, it's two steps removed from reality. An example I made up was that uh, we have a seven item test, we add up the score for each item, true or false, let's say, and we end up with a total score that indicates whether this person taking the test knows their stuff or not. And so that's kind of a situation where each item contributes the same amount to the total score. Here we have item two carrying more information adding more information to the total score and thereby contributing more to the latent construct. If this is a 
palp palpation um, or something like that, then this, this particular item is contributing more information about the skill of palpation than the red item is or the blue item. So it's more information. It's weighted. But why is it weighted? I mean, how did we weight it? That, that's, I hope he doesn't ask that question. You're not going to ask that question. It's the item total correlation. It's a single factor. It's factor loading. Okay, there's a number, number of ways to describe it, but I, I wanted to just, maybe this is too basic for you all, but uh, if we're looking at how some items contribute about the same as other items, but in fact, and this is intuitively uh, compelling, I think, some items are gonna tell us more about the underlying construct than other items. For, well, we'll get, I think we'll get to this. Well, the assumption is for classical test theory that we can make up a test and uh, Dr. McIsaac, what do, you, what do you teach these days? Anything? Neuroscience. Neuroscience. So you're, you're, you're pouring this sawdust into your students' heads and at the end of the term, you, you ask them to regurgitate something that would indicate that the sawdust has taken, taken hold, right? So we sit down and we make these questions up and we assume that if the person has uh, mastered the material, they'll do well on the test, right? But if we, if we think about it, maybe some of the questions are too easy, some are too hard, but maybe item two is really the kicker. You know, it's an essay question. It says, describe the thing, 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 and then how would you use it and how do you understand it? And so just... Any questions about that? So some questions are more important than others. Okay, so is two harder or easier with respect to the test? Is item two more or less likely to be endorsed vis-a-vis -vis the latent construct? We don't know yet. We just know that it adds more information to the test score. So I made up the Peacock test. I can't... Uh, can't find a turkey test, so I made up a peacock test. And um, I've seen, I've seen uh, wild peacocks. Uh, they sleep up in the trees at night in, in India, in Sri Lanka. And so each, each uh, affirmative answer on this test will tell you, you're probably looking at a peacock that's in front of you. So has feathers, okay, it's a bird. That's pretty easy. It flies, Do peacocks fly? Ish, yeah. <laughs> How'd they get up in the tree? Um, sleeps in trees, yes. Has bright colors, tail patterns look like eyes. They live in Sri Lanka. Now, if I'm in Sri Lanka and I'm looking and I see this bird, that doesn't mean it does live somewhere else. You know, some of these questions are pretty bad. Um, they weigh over 20 kilos. They still are birds. Uh, they have eyes. They have a beak or a bill. And if they have a bill, they might be a platypus. So they're, that's not discriminating, uh, absolutely. Um, they make annoying sounds. You ever heard of peacock? Oh, man. It's, it'll wake you up at night, that's for sure. Um, they attack humans. I've been attacked by a peacock and a swan. <laughs> um, leopards like to eat them um, and are tall. Adults are over one meter. Now, if you got all of those 14 points true and you added up the score, you get 14 points. We're 100% sure it's a peacock. Well, just for example, if they get less than 14, what is it? It's some, maybe it's not quite a peacock, but it's something a pheasant or a turkey or something. So this test, as bad as it is, is, is doing something. It's adding up information and helping us to converge on the de determination that this is a, a peacock. It's a silly example, but bear with me. So here's one of my pieces of work from a couple years ago where we used um, 
series of questions grouped by psychological abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and physical injury scales to find out if interpartner violence was severe enough that a child should be assigned to a foster home, basically. And there is a general factor. We did a factor analysis here for all of you that recognize that. After that general factor of violence was taken out, then you had some distinctions about the kind of violence. We, f we found that some tests make more distinctions if that's important and others are more general. So the factor loadings for those four factors are there, the correlations. And to some extent, we'd like to see the, 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 the six to 21 hang together because we sat down very carefully wrote these questions, and we said, this will get at psychological abuse. And how did that start? We sat down and we wrote them. Test them and kind of decide if they're actually getting at what you think they are getting at. So you can see some, the fact three is kind of hanging with psychological abuse, with the, the factor loadings, and so, we've been somewhat successful in creating an instrument that assesses psychological abuse. The other things are not so clear. Um, physical and sexual abuse, not all the items uh, load into that. So the point here being that I sit down and make up questions, they may or may not get at what I think I'm getting at. And that's the end of that. Uh, so the scaling method then uh, is a different approach. Uh, they both started in the early 20th century, but um, this one is kind of interesting. Here's another piece of This is assessing, uh, yeah, you can put on your glasses now. This is a good one. Anyway, we were looking at drug-drug interactions and we were comparing nursing students with pharmacy students with medical students at the University of Arizona. And we don't have the comparison here, but this is called an person, a person item map. So we asked a series of questions um, and down at the bottom here is the easy question. It's most likely to be endorsed by all of us without medical training even. It's nitroglycerin and Viagra. Why would that be so easily endorsed? Because it's on TV every night. And, uh, don't take it if you're on nitroglycerin or something. So we found that the students uh, are way up on this. And um, then acetaminophen, acetaminophen and codeine, warfarin and amiodarone, and simvastatin and itraconazole are harder questions. So the easy questions most commonly endorsed, easiest to endorse, are down here, and the hardest, the most difficult questions are. So this, um, well, let me explain then to this side of this dotted line axis is the way that people who took the test are distributed. So uh, zero, I don't see it, but anyway, you can see the two curves aren't symmetrical. That means the items tend to be hard or difficult because they're scooted up. Um, and um, the population of medical, nursing, and pharmacy students is kind of down a little bit. Well, oh, there's the zero. Yeah. So that's the uh, median. <coughs> um, anyway, the gaps, the gaps, the gaps. The, these gaps telling us that you could be, you could fall in this area here with respect to your understanding of drug drug interactions, and there's no test question for that. So you're missing something if that's important to you. All right, so, and this item gap here, there's, there's some people here. Each hash mark is three people. 
and the period is one person. So um, any, anybody that's in this capability or ability, um, we, we don't have it, we're not testing them. They're being omitted in a way. And you get up around here, you see that box that I put in, those are redundant questions. So they're all testing the same ability as well as the, well, same ability, let's just leave it at that. So I could take out a bunch of those questions if I want to streamline the test, uh, re reduce the administrative burden, um, because they're getting at the same level of ability. You see that? So is this a good test? It sucks, basically. No, it's, uh, it's got gaps in it, and then it's got a lot of redundancy. Um, it's not maybe the fault of the test so much as, because I helped make it. Uh, no, it, it, it might be we can come up with other combinations that will fill in the gaps and give us a smoother uh, report of the of the people who are uh, in their ability. The item person map that we just looked at is, uh, was a, uh, an innovation that goes with Rosh modeling. And again, I try to make this relevant to everything we do. This is the kind of research that we can do as educators in healthcare that uh, we should be getting a nice, smooth um, version of ability for cognition and for manual skills, and maybe some other things too. Empathy, there's a lot of things that we want our healthcare providers to be and have. So here's an ideal uh, test, dichotomous test. You either answer true or false. And never mind the very much, quite a bit so much, but here is our latent construct in logits. But just think of this as the latent construct. And this is an item that uh, is most easily endorsed, moderately endorsed, and the most difficult item. If we went from feathers over to I, eye pattern on tail. The eye pattern on tail subsumes these other notions, right? It's probably we could jump to eye pattern and say this is a peacock, but there are, there are albino peacocks. Okay, so it's not determinative. Absolutely. So, and then <clears throat> we can have a Likert tail. So we'd have a the, uh, from one to five, does a, does a peacock have eye pattern on the tail? Do they have a beak? Do they have eyes? So on. So this is the way that looks. And this is a nice, this is ideal, but it's showing that for every piece of the construct, it's pretty well covered by the question. It's, uh, it's the latent construct. Okay, so this is 3D. Um, the invariant, the invariance that we're looking for is that people with the same ability will show up with the same test results across tests, and they will be ranked in the same level with their peers. So if I'm in the 50th percentile on one test for a certain ability, I'd be 50th percentile on another test. So we've got some invariance there in our measurement. That's a pretty good picture. All right, so here is um, a, an item person map on Roche analysis for vision. I think it's for vision. Yeah, vision least and most visual ability. It's flipped upside down from what uh, the other one was. 
but this has nice coverage. For every person, this is nicely grouped, their and level of their ability, there's a question or a test, physical test, that would uh, indicate their ability to, to see. And at the top, excuse me, this is, like I said, flipped, but there might be something, one or two tests that will subsume all the other tests, replace them. Now here's a, a Likert scale item. This is a single item, and it has nice coverage on the theta with the latent construct. So whatever it is we're measuring there, those choices are doing a good job of telling us about the person's ability. Okay, so uh, another way to look at uh, this is that it's an orthopedic test, a reflex test, and you're getting different levels of, uh, of response to those tests. Now here's a, let's see, 15 items on a, each item has its own set of curves because it's Likert scale. And you can see that uh, number one is covered pretty much by the two choices on that item. There's a black and a red curve. But they're off, they're not really telling us much. They're off to the side. And the number two item, the black curve and then the red, green, and blue smaller curves are leaving the top end open. So the persons with high ability are getting missed with that item. A difficult, the items that are difficult to endorse, the difficult items, are not strong. They're not telling us much about the, the underlying construct. So what's a good item in here? Probabilities of endorsement of the, uh, the item. I guess, the, except for the first one, none of them are very good. They all tend to top out. It, I call it a floor effect, because they're, they're, everyone's answering kind of on the low end. So our test needs to be reconfigured to catch uh, the high end people with greater ability. These are Likert scale questions. People are saying they're, they're tending to agree with one, uh, one aspect of the item S sometimes or never, let's say. And, uh, but they're not, they're not getting to the high end of the latent, the latent trait. Uh, the question is, uh, would be, this be like a satisfaction survey? And I think that that's a better analogy for this, this test. People are saying, yeah, they're minimally satisfied. But there aren't any high rankings in these items. So that could be the fault of the test, but it could also be that you've got a lousy product or service. So in summary, we want to test with items that are informative as to a person's ability. We can eliminate some items that are redundant. We, can, uh, we want items so they cover the entire range of the trait, construct, or theta. It all means the same thing. And we do not want gaps in our measurement, but rather incremental measures of ability across the scale. We want measures that are invariant across test items and persons. So that just means, again, we want to be able to test people in such a way that we have a really solid assessment of their learn, what they've learned. Okay, so if we use different tests, different times, they'll come up with this is my ability. And uh, their ranking, their class ranking will be the same irrespective of test. We want, uh, we want a range that cover what we're measuring, ability to do surgery or something, but we want our measurement to be invariant across measurements. So if they have surgery, they have surgical ability, other tests will find them with the same skill level. And in, among their classmates, the persons, 
they rank about the same. One of these books says that Einstein considered uh, calling his general theory of relativity the invariance theory because he was looking for something that would uh, not be rel uh, subjective relative. So underlying machinery of this is how computer adaptive testing works. Because we can pick five or 10 items, if they know the first items they jump to, instead of giving them a bunch of easy items, we can jump to a moderately difficult item. And um, if, they, when get, if they get that correct or those correct, they can move on to the more difficult items. If they can't, if they bump into the middle moderate items and they're not doing well, test can be over. They can jump ahead to the more difficult items, couple of those answered correctly, tests can be over. So it can eliminate uh, lengthy tests that aren't providing any more information. You could take out, well, pretty much what I said, but you could also just take out items that are redundant. Uh, you can apply these to diagnostic tests. And I think that's a very interesting application. Uh, like I said, physical therapists seem to be taking the lead on that from what I've read and uh, biomarkers and cancer screening. If you have, as we're looking at now, salivary biomarkers could tell us if you have pancreatic cancer, which is a deadly disease, you, <clears throat> you might be able to take one or two biomarkers that are peculiar to that particular cancer and say, go in for more tests, rather than taking more and more samples that are not going to add that much more information. So, and then that's a good one too. That's your reward for sitting through the. <laughs> Any questions or comments? That was uh, that was the extent of it. My presentation. <laughs>